So I want to talk about this passage, Romans 12, the first few verses. Um, The way he starts off, we talked last week about God's endless mercy. And notice how Paul starts off. Of course, we're following following his uh, reading here, his writings through Romans. And so it's not surprising that he starts with mercy. He says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, So according to these endless mercies, these mercies that never come to an end, that's the motivation, right? It's it's because God is endlessly merciful that now he says, I urge you to do something. So his, his urging towards a kind of way of living is because we know God is merciful. It's not because we fear God's judgment. It's not because we think, well, God might punish us if we don't. It's not because we think, well, God's stern. No, he says, in light of the mercies of God. And and what he talks about then, he says, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. So I'm talking about being unconventional, talking about being a nonconformist this morning, because Paul is. He says, you know, don't, don't just be a conformist. Don't be someone who just goes along. We're talking about something different that you're going to engage in, and it's a way of life. And the first thing he says that certainly for the context of the ancient world, 2,000 years ago, when he says, Here's what I want you to do. Think about offering yourselves, your living self, your body, alive to God as an act of worship. Now, everyone in those days thought the epitome of worship was killing something and throwing it up on an altar. Whether it's, you know, everyone sacrificed animals. The Greeks did. The Romans did. And certainly the Jews did. Everyone did. And so here's this nonconformist, radical idea, this unconventional thought. He says, in light of the mercies of God, here's an idea. How about you offer yourselves to God and that be your worship? Is he talking about go to ritual ceremonies? No. He's talking about the way you live, the way we live, each and every day is the act of worship why I don't make a big emphasis on who attends. We never even count who's here. I've never in 20 years ever counted the number of people sitting here. It's just not that important, right? It's important in the sense that we're gathering together to, to, to do something, to put something into practice, but it's not important in the sense of, you know, this is where the worship really happens, you know, when you're sitting here. No, the worship really happens as we offer ourselves to God on a daily basis. And sometimes we we gather together to remind ourselves about that real task of worship, but this is not, you know, the epitome of it. And the reason we ought to think that way is because of Paul and what he's outlining. And I think it's ultimately because of Jesus. Where did Jesus, where did Paul get this idea? I think he got it from Jesus. Jesus wasn't big on telling people, oh, make sure you go to synagogue every Sabbath. In fact, I don't even know anywhere in the gospel where he really told anybody that that's what you need to be doing. But he told lots of people things like, well, love your neighbors yourself. And that doesn't just mean on the Sabbath in synagogue. That means every day. When Jesus is talking to people about life and how to live it well in the presence of God, how to embrace his kingdom of God. He's talking about how you live every day. He's not talking about go to temple and participate in rituals. He's not talking about go to synagogue and be a part of those meetings. Even though he does those things, he's trying to tell people it's about the way you live your life. That's what Paul's talking about. And what Paul, I think, in essence is saying is, now that's a nonconformist way to look at the world. That's That's an unconventional way of looking at the spiritual life. It was for his day. I still think it is today. I think if we look at 
what it means to be a follower of Jesus and realize it's lived out spiritually on a day-to-day -day basis and it's not centered on whether or not you gather on a Sunday, that's going to be pretty unconventional for a lot of people. And notice what he says about this not being conformed. Verse 2, he says, And do not be conformed to the, this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I really like the way he tells us how it is that we start engaging this transformation. There's conformity that's following the narrative, the script, the pattern that's given to us by society, by culture, what, main, what maybe a lot of other people are doing. But he says, in contrast to that, there's a being transformed. And he locates that in the renewing of our mind. Now, that doesn't mean it's a purely intellectual exercise. That doesn't mean it's only for highly intelligent people. Now, he's not talking about it like that. What he means is mind here is more like the way you think about things, the way you look at things, your perspective. So it's not, it's not about having high intelligence or academic credentials or something, the renewing of our mind is a fresh way of understanding who I am, who my neighbor is, who God is. Big questions like, well, what's the meaning of life? How do I live life well? He's talking about being transformed and it starts with a transformed understanding, kind of picture a way of viewing everything, a perspective, a world view. And so when we think about it, we have to think about, so what does it mean for us to begin there with a renewed perspective? So while it is not about study per se and academics, it is about how we think about things. And Paul goes on to say, okay, so he wants us to engage the trans this transformation by the renewing of your minds so that you may prove what the will of God is. Prove here doesn't mean like prove it to someone else. It doesn't mean like give evidence. Some translations I think will do a little bit better job and say so that you will know or be able to discern. Or it's almost like prove to yourself, figure out. What he's talking about is we want to be transformed to this new perspective, and you can say it, it can begin with this idea of think of yourself as a living offering instead of all the other ways that you see religion being practiced around you. Think of yourself as a living offering to God based on God's endless mercies. That's not the story being told in Greek religion, Roman religion, Judaism. That's a very different, different understanding. And he says, so start with this renewing of your mind, your way of thinking. And what it's, what it's gonna, what's going to happen is you will be able to prove, kind of figure out for yourself, come to the understanding, well, this is what the will of God is. Prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. In other words, figure out how to live. How do you live? What does it mean to have lived a meaningful life? What does it mean to have been, quote-unquote, successful in life. And Paul is urging us to have a renewed mind about those things and to be able to discern, figure out what that means in terms of what the will of God is. And notice then how he goes on in this passage. And I'm going to head, I'm heading towards some of the things that Lee was talking about in children's time and that are kind of obvious towards the end of this passage. As he starts to talk about, here's how a renewed perspective then gets lived out. And he can't say everything, but he's going to say some things. So verse 3, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Now that's a renewed perspective, because everybody's striving for high self-esteem, right? I mean, there's a big emphasis on high self-esteem, and I understand there's a certain place if, in fact, you are kind of loathing yourself, and humility is not loathing yourself, it's not hating yourself, 
It's a true and realistic perspective of oneself, acknowledging both that which is your strengths as well as admitting freely what are your weaknesses. And so what Paul says is, so I want you to not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. Now that is not a solitary exercise, right? How, if I'm completely alone and only, you know, interacting, as it were, just about myself, how can I know what is thinking too highly of myself? That is measured with respect to others. See, instantly this becomes something in community, in relationship. When, I, when, when Paul tells me, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought, what does that mean? With respect to others. Right? He's envisioning that this is now a shared relational reality. And in this renewed perspective, you know, you know what it is you can both offer, but also you understand what it is that you can't because it's not your giftedness. As he goes on to talk about giftedness, he says, and the Corinthians particularly had a problem with this because they all were striving and, and coveting particular spiritual gifts rather than then accepting kind of what they had been given individually. But see, this is in relationship to one another. He says, so I don't want you to think more highly of yourself than you ought, but to think so as to have sound judgment. In other words, a, an honest, truthful perspective of yourself in relationship with others. And he says, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. And see, and so it becomes obvious he's talking about we are in relationship, we are in community, we are sharing, giving and taking from one another. And so how I think of myself has to be truthful and appropriate within those relationships. And part of what I need to know is what is it that I offer? Because it's not, it's not prideful to be honest, right? If you truly offer something, then, then to say, yeah, that's a gift I have is not being prideful. To, to deny that you have the gift you have is actually what we would call false humility. It's like, oh, no, I couldn't do that. Yes, you can. You're actually very good at that. You're not being humble by, by saying, oh, no, I couldn't do that. If you're good at it, you say, yes, I could do that. But then humility also recognizes, and there's other things that, this other person, these people do better than I. And so I rely on them and I offer my gift. Paul goes on to describe some of the specifics of what those are, giving um, verse 5, he says, So we who are many are one body in Christ, individually members one of another. And so there's this, there's this interconnectedness, there's this interdependence that we, we cannot suffice in life alone, in, you know, in, a, in an autonomous way, individualistically. We need one another, and we rely on one another. And Paul goes on to talk about, well, for the person who has this gift, here's what they can do and do well. Here's what they need to have, what virtue to go with that gift. So I want for us to think then about that kind of relational picture in terms of the renewing of our minds. Because I think that's part and parcel of it. What he said earlier is, I want you to be renewed in your minds because that's the beginning of transformation. And then he talks about how you need one another and how you have something to offer, but also things to receive. I so much believe that's a part of this transformed life that he's talking about, which begins with a renewed perspective. So the renewed perspective that we think about this morning is the importance of a community with whom we practice together this way of life. I've said it this way in the past to make the point is you could not be a Christian on a deserted island. He was saying, well, yes, I can 
I could, I could think about how Jesus is the Son of God, and I would be a Christian all by myself on that deserted island. And I would say, but thinking about Jesus as the Son of God does not make you a Christian. If being a Christian is what you do, I don't know how, if you were alone on a desert island how you would do anything Christian. Because it's what you do to, to and for others, right? There is no, I'm a Christian because I have all these ideas in my head. No, I'm a Christian because I follow the way of Christ and it's how I treat my neighbors and it's a lived out reality. Yes. Yeah. Jean, Jean Paul Sartre, the French philosopher, said, Hell is other people. A real cheery guy. But the other thing was, he's, in some ways, he's tapping into something very honest, right? Often that's where the struggle is, but that's where Jesus places us. He says, you need to love your neighbors. Not because he thinks that's easy, but that's transformative for them and for us. And then he pushes it a step further. He says, oh, and you need to love your enemy. We think, holy cow, not our enemies. Maybe the people I find pleasant. Maybe if I love them. Right? But Jesus' way that he lives out and then, as Paul is talking to us about, is this, it, this shared reality. It's, we are only as Christian as we treat those next to us, our neighbors. That's the measure of how much we are really living out the faith. You know, as I was a kid, we would have Bible Bowl. You know, we'd go compete. We'd see how many questions we could answer. It's not the worst exercise in the world. But you could do really well at Bible Bowl, and it had really nothing to do much with how much you lived out the faith. It was how you could answer questions and whether you could beat the other team. Paul does not envision the renewing of our minds being that kind of gathering of knowledge for knowledge's sake. He envisions it as how well we live in community with others. And that is always a challenging and difficult thing to do. And maybe if we have, as he says here, a humble and sound judgment about ourselves, we will realize, you know what? I think sometimes for others it's challenging and difficult to live in community with me. Right? In ways perhaps I do not perceive, others have to extend to me grace and patience and love and put up with me and my obstinate, difficult ways. So the call of Paul is to be unconventional. Some of us kind of like that idea. We're just kind of born wanting to be different, wanting to make our own mark. Maybe for some of us, Fitting in has been such a high priority. The call to be a nonconformist is like, I don't know, that doesn't come easily to me. But in the ways he's speaking about it, conformity to Christ is nonconformity with the world. And that's what we aspire to do. And may God, by his grace, continue to help us all in that task. Amen.